Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come if we can figure out what it's going to be. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hey, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, the world's only remaining full-time Beatles reporter. You can read his work in Billboard.com, Axis.com, and um, Goldmine, and Variety, and you name it, all over the place. And he's also the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Uh, Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay. So... We're recording this on John Lennon's birthday, what would have been his 77th birthday, and John will be the subject of the show a bit later, Um, but first we'll do our uh, overview of the news, and uh, I guess the one thing is the last week, if you listened to last week's show, we were sort of, uh, we had the news that Tom Petty had taken ill, was rushed to the hospital, uh, was on life support, and at the time we didn't know what the situation was because it had been reported that he died and then that he hadn't died, and um, then later that night he did die. So uh, we we talked a bit about Tom Petty last week, but uh, any any other thoughts looking back, uh, Ken? Oh, there's so many thoughts, really. You know, as far as the Beatle connection, there's there's quite a lot of them, mainly with George and with Ringo. Uh-huh. Of course, you have to talk about the Traveling Wilburys and what a you know how much fun it was when those two albums came out. Although we had to deal with the passing of Roy Orbison after the uh-huh. first album was released, but those are two really fine albums, and we've talked about that several times here on the show and. You know, it's a funny thing about the Traveling Wilburys. Sometimes the best things that happen in life are what's not planned. Yeah. And the Traveling Wilburys was just that. I mean, George just needed to record a B-side for a European single for This Is Love from Cloud Nine. And he he needed a song. And at the time, it just so happens that, um, you know, he was working with Jeff Lynne. Jeff was friends with. Roy Orbison and Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. And of course, George has the long association with Bob Dylan and going all the way back to the Beatle days with Roy Orbison. And so they came up with the song Handle With Care and the record company felt it was too good to make a B-side. So, you know, the story goes that they decided they were going to make an album and Bob Dylan had to go on tour fairly soon after that. So they only had a very short amount of time. I think it was something like a week to 10 days and they came up with a batch of songs that are just great fun rock and roll Mm -hmm. and uh who who could have ever predicted first of all to have a band with those five members Mm -hmm. and even though you know it's funny i i think sometimes you assume that when you have all this talent in one band it's going to be great no matter what Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way It's kind of like an all-star baseball team with all this talent that somehow doesn't gel. It doesn't have to be that way. But the Traveling Wilburys worked because they were all, you know, very respectful of each other. They all loved each other's work, and they all had a great sense of humor that came over in the music. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully, we have two albums of the Traveling Wilburys. You know, I'm very grateful that they continued to make a second album after Roy died. Right. But, uh, you know, there's so many things, you know, to talk about with Tom, especially with George, with George a, a bit with Ringo. And uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about that or, you know, have me mainly talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, you've got um, the song Cheer Down, which mm-hmm. is one of my favorite uh, of recent recordings from George. And that was actually written by George and Tom Petty. And I remember George bringing up uh, the fact that Tom came up with the line, if your dog should be dead, I'm going to love you instead, Mm -hmm. which is a really funny line that he put in there. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, kind of typical of Tom Petty and his sense of humor. And um, you've got the uh, tribute 
to John Lennon of I Call Your Name, which was uh, part of a video that was made in 1990 that was a tribute to John Lennon in Liverpool. And both Ringo and Paul were not there in person, but they submitted videos. And um, Ringo made the cover of I Call Your Name. And Tom Petty was in the video playing along, as was Jeff Lynne. And also uh, Jim Keltner was in there and Joe Walsh mm-hmm. as well. So, and that was a really fine cover of I Call Your Name. I enjoy hearing that and playing that on my show. Ringo appeared on Tom Petty's album Wildflowers. He, he played on a track called To Find a Friend. Uh, there's also the concert for George where uh, Tom appeared with the Heartbreakers and did a couple of George's Beatles songs. Uh, Tax Man and I Need You, and as well as uh, Handle With Care. Mm-hmm. Most of all, one thing that I, that I remember about Tom as far as George is concerned, which not too many people talk about, is when they had a, a TV broadcast of the Billboard Awards, and George was the recipient of the first Billboard Century Award. And Tom Petty did the introduction for that, and it was a great introduction. Mm-hmm. And he gave the award to George on camera on tv and that was a pretty high moment also the uh the bob dylan 30th anniversary concert sure the very end of which uh, everybody performed my back pages and george sang a verse and tom petty sang a verse it's kind of funny you'd think that bob dylan would be last mm-hmm. doing the verses because it's a tri- you know a tribute to him but george was last eric clapton was on stage neil young roger mcguinn and tom petty and george and that was a you know, an incredible moment right there. So many wonderful things that, that uh, Tom Petty took part in as far as George is concerned and Ringo. Also, the, the video for I Won't Back Down, right. which had both George and Ringo in it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, uh, that's a pretty mean feat to have two Beatles in your own video. <laughs> and even though, you know, Ringo didn't play drums on the song, in the video you see him playing drums hmm. to the song, as well as he's... he's kind of circling this globe. He's looking right at it. It's kind of funny. But that was a very wilbur song because Jeff Lynn's in there too on the, right. on the video. Um, so you could probably kind of throw that into the to the Wilbury's uh, a barrel there because uh, it, it, it sounds a lot a lot like the album, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Sure. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of activity there between Tom and George and Ringo. So, uh, you know, apart from the fact that he's been a mainstay in our lives for the last 40 plus years on on rock radio. I mean, there's hardly a day that goes by because most of the time when I listen to the radio, I listen in my car Mm -hmm. and I do a lot of channel surfing. But hardly a day goes by when I don't hear Tom's music. And that says something, you know, and um, he just put out an incredible catalog. So many great songs. And um and that's it. <laughs> I don't know what more to say, but that, that's quite a lot right there as far as the Beatle end of things. Yeah, I think that one of the things about Tom Petty that's kind of interesting is he's actually significantly younger than the Beatles. Um, right. And, 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 mean, the, and yeah, yeah uh, that's a that's a good point, because, I mean, the Wilburys were basically all these older guys and they and they pulled in Petty. Yeah. And that's an extreme. That says a lot right there about him, you know. Well, he was another one of these people, I think, who um, you know took up his guitar after seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. You know, there's a there's sort of a, a lot of people like that, and I think it's sort of a direct inspirational link in a way. And but you know, he right. also I... you know, he also um, adhered like Dave Grohl as well, to, you know, the sort of classic, um, you know, 60s rock kind of sound and feel, the idea of real instruments being played at one time in a room, you know, that was, that was basically his aesthetic and uh, in, a, in a style that was not radically different from, you know, the Beatles, Birds kind of, sound of the, of the sixties. I mean, he, it, you hear a Tom Petty track, you know, it's Tom Petty. It's, it's, it's you know, mm-hmm. clearly him. I mean, there, apart from that, you recognize his voice. There are certain stylistic things that are, you know, his and not picked up from sixties things, but nevertheless, there's, there's that 
general sound and general approach that's um that's of that time and of his own time you know it was it, he was both he had a foot in both worlds right mm -hmm. was well put and he always talked about his influences and mentioning the beatles and the stones and the birds and mm -hmm. you know he wore it on his sleeve sure and mm -hmm. um yeah, apart from that i also think about a guy that had integrity mm -hmm. Because he he fought his record company when they wanted to raise the list price on his album. Yeah. Just because it was very popular, he also fought Ticketmaster, I believe it was, at the time when uh, service charges became <laughs> uh, added to the price mm. of your concert tickets. So he wanted to handle the tickets all by himself. You know, and I admire a guy like that. You mm -hmm. know. One thing that was really noticeable this week was how much his death affected everybody. Mm. I mean, it wasn't just, I mean, normally when celebrities pass on, there isn't the reverberation like there was with Petty. And it, every, I mean, it, you know, you could see, especially in the, well, in the initial comments, especially because it was such a shock the way it all happened. But even as the week went on, you know, a lot of people were, really mourning his passing i mean ex you know really hard and i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he it, you know, i was surprised he his age was what was it 66 66 yeah. i mean i did, yeah i didn't think he was that old he didn't look that old and the and the also too the fact that he had just a week before had played the hollywood bowl i mean that was the end of the tour and and he had other dates scheduled in November, he was going back out on the road. Yeah. So you know that's, I think that that's the the thing that really got to a lot of people that he had a very youthful look, and a lot of people, especially you know, people you know who'd been around in the seventies and eighties and who you know who liked his music. I mean, this wasn't it. it we're not talking about somebody from the sixties now. We're talking from the seventies and eighties, which which means a younger generation of fans i mean this is probably the first big rocker from that era from the 70s or 80s i, well, I shouldn't say first but i mean probably one of the biggest rockers from the 70s or 80s that has passed on like that and the fact i don't that know about that i mean the last couple of years we've had to deal with david bowie Right. And I think right. that that's a true. lot that's of true. people that's true a too. lot of people were affected by Bowie's death. No, you you sure. I'm sorry. You you you're very right there. You're right about you're right about Bowie. And uh, that I, went on. That went on for a while after well, his, it's still, his death. Well, still it actually still yeah. is. I no, I yeah. was I was wrong there. You you're right. But Petty Petty just seemed to have this very youthful look and maybe it had something to do with the fact that he was the young guy in the Wilburys that you know against all these older guys. But, you know, I think that really hit people pretty hard so and you also you also had prince and i think that affected right. a lot of people right. too true yeah. true and, that, duh uh, okay you know as well and, as well as actually, george michael you know, and actually well. prince and prince and you know it, did you mention prince and tom petty playing while my guitar gently weeps at I did, the I did rock and roll hall of fame yeah, yeah see there's there's a, a moment that in fact, I think I posted that online right after, you know, as we were in the first few hours after the news came out that, that he was ill. I mean, that alone and, and seeing Prince's guitar solo and the whole thing, I mean, that was just – that still is probably one of the – you know, for all the criticism that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame gets, and we won't even talk about the nominees this week, never mind. You know, <laughs> I mean, that was one really good moment, you know, so – Anyway, but you know, there's there's one other thing that I just want to bring up, which has really bothered me for the last couple of years. Apart from the fact that we've lost so many great and talented people, and the fact that, as far as I'm concerned, if you're under 80 years old, you're still young. <laughs> That's just <laughs> the way you. that I look at it. Thank you. You know, <laughs> but it's it's the coverage that the death gets. I mean, there's hardly anything that's ever done on television now. It's all on the internet. And that really bothers me. I mean, you might get something on the crawler about Tom Petty right. dying. Yeah. And, you know, obviously because of what happened in Las Vegas, that has to take precedence over everything else. But Tom Petty mattered. Right. You know, David Bowie mattered. You know, these people, Prince, all the ones that we mentioned. And 
it gets very little coverage on TV. You got to rely on the internet now. You got to go on Facebook to to read yeah. articles, you know. And that that really gets to me because it it almost makes it seem like these people don't matter. As well, much. there there was a great tribute today that uh, um, our friend Harold Lepidus uh, passed on to me that just a, a little a little while ago. A cartoon done by Andy Marlette of the Pensacola News Journal, and it's it shows it's a it it's worth looking up if you haven't seen it. If you look up uh, Marlette, it's M A R L E T T E, and it shows uh, Tom Petty arriving at the pearly gates, and Roy Orbison and George Harrison are there to meet him, and Petty says, "I can't believe I beat Dylan here." <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> That that is yeah. just just a wonderful tribute. But anyway, okay. What one more thing? Because yeah. I know that um, you know Paul and Ringo issued statements. But I, I listened to an interview that um, Danny Harrison gave, and he referred to Tom Petty as a dad to him, because after George died, you know he was an only child, and he relied on certain people that he was very close to, and and Tom and Jeff Lynn are like dads to him. Oh yeah. So you can just imagine how he's feeling, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh yeah, that must have been. Go. It must have been very hard for Danny too. So. Oh, anyway, sure. okay. Should so we, we get have, to? Um, yeah, we have some other news, right, Steve? We you have some other that. news. Yeah, yeah, I'll run through this very, relatively uh, quickly. Um, Ringo announced uh, this past week that he's donating. The, uh, or he's making a dona- uh, donation and dedicating his first concert at the um, uh, in in Las Vegas to the victims of the Las Vegas uh, shooting at the that's at the Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas on the 13th. So that was uh, cool, and I you know I actually haven't seen any other entertainers doing that kind of a thing so that's that's good you well know, actually good... you know you see a lot of entertainers raising money for puerto rico as well i mean there's just so right. much going on to to raise money for now that it's um you know people have you know whatever their their particular personal priorities are um, right you know. uh, uh, there, there was the there was the thing on saturday night live with jason aldean who mm-hmm. by the by the way who who spoke about Ve- who was the guy on the stage right at vegas right. when it happened and he spoke about it and then what does he perform i, I won't, won't back, back down. down right yeah uh, it's a very classy move right yeah. right and very actually yeah i can i mean it must have taken a lot of you know must have been a lot of emotion for him doing that, you know, on such short notice like that. And it was a, that was a very cool idea that Saturday Night Live did. For those of you that had not planned to pick up the Pirates of the Caribbean DVD, here's a reason to possibly – you might want to consider it. You know that Paul McCartney is in the movie briefly singing Maggie Mae. You can barely recognize him. I mean, in fact, when I saw the movie originally, I was like, that's Paul McCartney? But And sure enough, it is. But the special features on the DVD have an interview with Paul talking and joking with Johnny Depp and how he – how Depp asked him to, to be in the movie and how it, it was kind of uh, trading favors because Depp has been in, in Paul's Video. music videos. Right, yeah, and, and, they, they, and they both kind of joke about that. But the, but the, the real reason to get the DVD – not only do they show the version in the movie of Paul singing Maggie Mae, they show the whole the whole clip of Paul in there uh, and and how Johnny comes on him in the the dungeon and he says Uncle Jack. He Paul plays uh, Johnny Depp's uh, uh, Captain Jack's Uncle Jack, who he was named for. But at one point, one of the directors says, "We made Paul do a quiet on the set take." And so all you see is Paul singing Maggie Mae with nothing happening on the set. So it's not the version – besides the version in the movie that's in the movie and in the special feature, there's an additional version, an outtake, so to speak, of Paul singing it with no noise, no background noise. Ooh. So there's a reason to pick up the movie. The movie itself is is okay. I mean I – I, I will say that we saw a preview of it when we were in Disneyland in 3D. That was absolutely wonderful. It's the beginning part where Johnny, De- where they have the uh, the bank vault, 
and that was just one that is hilarious and that and there are some there are a couple of nice moments like that in the movie um but definitely you know that's a reason to pick up the dvd so but is he he's playing guitar right to maggie may he, is he well if it's no, a, if it's a cappella then he's not playing anything right yeah i don't think okay. i don't think i don't think he's playing anything in, in the movie at all uh i think he's just he's just uh singing so, okay. but like I said, the first time when, when Johnny Depp comes into the scene, there's all sorts of noise around him. The second time when they do the quiet on the set, it's just Paul singing. Right. So, so you can add right. your own guitar part. You can, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, the new Jeff Beck live at the Hollywood Bowl video and CD that came out, uh, this past week has a, um, live version of Jeff Beck doing a day in the life which is not the reason to really get the the disc. I mean, the 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 concert is is a good, very good show, and he goes back through his whole catalog. He plays all sorts of things. There's he does a, a several Yardbirds tracks, one uh, some with Jimmy Hall who sings great, and some with Steven Tyler, who sings great. And then he uh, Jan Hammer is in is in there who who he played with. Um, on uh, an album uh, or two. I, I can't remember if it's at least an album. Unfortunately, as I said in my review that I wrote on Axis, I wish Rod Stewart or, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, somebody else had come in there because there, there were a couple of songs that uh, that uh, really would have been nice to, to hear. But there's a lot of good songs in there. So it's a good, it's a good uh, retro uh, through Jeff Beck's career, and he still plays like oh, he. I mean, he hasn't lost a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing I remarked is how how good he looks. I think he looks better than Jagger. Actually, I, he's a little young. He's less than a year younger than Jagger, but he looks like about five years younger than Jagger does. So, right. and then, <laughs> speaking of Jagger, but you know, what well, one more ahead. thing. Go ahead. You know that um, the studio version that Jeff Beck recorded of A Day in the Life goes Mm -hmm. back to an album that George Martin made called In My Life. Mm -hmm. And he appeared on that and and George produced it. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, I (laughs) forgot. I forgot about that. That album was so weird. I mean, it had so many uh, unusual things about it, but Robin uh, Williams, (laughs) Robin Williams. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That was, uh, that was something else. And then since we're mentioning, um, the, Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones announced this past week, or it, it came out this past week that the Rolling Stones are putting out a, a BBC album. Not, It's not going to be nearly as, it's going to only be one disc. And I'm su- really surprised that they're not going a little crazier. They are putting out a book with it uh, called On Air. But I'm glad to see that, uh, that that's finally out, although bootleggers have had this stuff for years. Uh, and actually, they've had more. And, and in fact, I was saying that there were some BBC tracks uh, that were auctioned, I believe it was last year or the year before, including one that the Rolling Stones never recorded, and those aren't on the album, unfortunately. So, But anywho. Hmm. Uh, I wonder so, where they got that title on air. Gee, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, they're slowing I, down. They're slowing down. It used to be, I think John once said, you know, if how come... if if the Rolling Stones are so innovative, how come everything the Beatles do, the Stones do six months later? Now it's like four or five years later. Right. Um, obviously, right. they need to, yeah. you know. I and I do. And uh, by the way, I want to be your man. Is on that. Is on that CD. So. Okay. 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 And uh, there's a Gary Clark cover. Yes. In a, in a new film, right, Ken? Yeah, he just covered Come Together, Mm -hmm. which is in the new Justice League film, which Mm -hmm. um, I heard is going to open in mid-November. But you can actually hear that version online. You can go on YouTube Mm -hmm. from Gary Clark Jr., who's a great guitar player. And one of these days we'll have to do another cover show and catch up with some of the new ones and Uh and old ones we neglected last time. Um, Mm -hmm. So any other news? There's one thing that I forgot to mention about Tom Petty, and that is that when Ringo released his album Vertical Man, he did a cover version of Drift Away, the Dolby Gray classic, which is kind of appropriate for Ringo to sing because the line goes, give me the beat, boys. 
But uh, originally, Steven Tyler was on the recording there to sing a verse. But at the time, the record company pulled it. They, uh, Columbia Records didn't want two records out at the same time. Aerosmith had the single, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. And they didn't want there to be any confusion <laughs> uh, with having two records out with Steven Tyler on it. So they pulled uh, Steven Tyler's vocal. And they replaced it with Tom Petty, who phoned in his vocal and sang a verse on there. And the version with Steven Tyler went out as a promo. But the one that was on uh, the actual album had Tom Petty on it. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. As well as Alanis Morissette, who also sings a verse. So it's kind of uh, several vocals, multi-vocals, lead vocals on that song. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. Okay, so we should move on to the main order of business for the night, which is celebrating John's birthday. And what we decided to do was each choose five songs that we particularly like of John's from his solo career, but that were not released as singles. So we've tied one hand behind our backs, and uh, there's plenty of good stuff to choose from. And um, who should we start with? Let's start with Steve. Oh, okay. Well, this was actually tougher than than I thought it would be, and I and I got I have to admit, um, I I had the resource that I used here was uh, Steve or no, this isn't Steve Turner. It's Paul DeNoyer's John Lennon, the stories behind every song. Um, which is a great little book if you're looking for information on Lennon's solo career. Um, but here's here's what I here's what I picked. Um, I love Plastic Ono Band. Uh-huh. I love both Lennon and Yoko's Plastic Ono Band. So I picked uh, two songs from that. I picked Love, uh-huh. and uh, because I mean that's such a such a great and it's it's actually. It's it's actually uh, it's 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 such a non Lennon type song. I mean, you're you're expecting, you don't expect it to to you don't expect him to do tender songs like that, and it's it's just so non typical, uh, untypical of him. And then God, which I think is so emotional, and I love you know uh, the way. And I really had trouble. I mean, uh, I you know I kind of wanted to put almost every song on that album because I love. I love that album so much. Um, you know, working class. I, I had working class hero on my uh, on my list for a while, and you know, I mean, that was such a a pioneering song with the, with all the uh, you know with all the the uh, swearing in it. But um, but love and God were the two I picked out of that al- album. And then I picked uh, how do you sleep for probably for obvious reasons. I th- I think the reasons were obvious there because of the. The, you know the way they went back and forth at each other at the time. I love that. I, I, I just love that song though. It's just a great song. The next one I picked uh, is New York City from an album that everybody seems to hate. Uh, I'm not sure. Not me. Not me. Really? No. Really? Okay. Not at all. Well, good for you uh, because a, a lot of people do. Everybody seems to take that one down, and and uh, there there are some good moments on that, and, and that's one of them. And then the last one, I went a little deeper than than normal, and I picked "I Know I Know," hmm. um, and nice. and I I really like that. So anyway, what is it about that song? I'm just curious. Uh, it's just it, it's such a joyful song, so, as is New York City for that matter, but in a in a different way. It's just real bouncy and and joyful, and I just I I, I liked it. So there. Okay, you know, um, you you said about love that it, it, that it's surprising that he sang would not that we don't expect him to sing such a tender song. But I mean, there's Julia and there's there's various yeah. um, things over the years, um, right? Yeah, I mean, in in the same way, I mean, people always usually the discussion is about Paul, and everybody says he's singing these gentle love songs and people bring up Helter Skelter, but, you know, John had that mm-hmm. other side too. They both did. They both had, you know, both the sort of screaming rocker side and the tender ballad side, I think. But love is a good one. You know, there's um, there's an alternate mix. 
when it came out as a single, I think just in the UK, I'm not sure this was released in the US, but um, when it came out as a single after he died, um, it had a sort of hard opening instead of the fade in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a a little collectible variation for you. I also so. was going to do oh my, uh well, all right, we were going to save the runner ups to last. But all oh my love was the one that that I and I'm not doing it now. Um all oh my love <laughs> uh was on my list for quite a while and that one that one uh you know ended up not being on there. What was surprising though as we you know when we talked about this last week, I really didn't think I was thinking well, it's going to be it's going to be kind of difficult because there isn't. Uh, I mean, because so many John Lennon songs were released as singles, yeah. they weren't. They weren't. And I was really amazed when I went through the list. I'm going, that's all the singles that they've released from him. It's it's like wow. They, well, I mean, there were there's... a lot of posthumous ones, and I wasn't sure if we were counting those or not, and I wasn't sure if we were counting B sides or not. But. Um... Yeah, the, the, well, the, I I left I I avoided tried to avoid all of those I think. Yeah. Uh, so, mm. okay. well, you know the the solo Beatles. There's so many albums they released that either had no singles or one single, mm -hmm. and that's really uh, it's quite sad in a way because so many songs deserve to be singles that weren't. I mean, just take a look at the Imagine album. Yeah. You know, it only had Imagine. Right. That's right. it. <laughs> The Mind Games album only had Mind Games. So, so many songs are worthy of being singles and being hits and, and big hits, I feel. Mm -hmm. So, it's very much like that. Yeah. Um, with Double Fantasy, you know, because it came out right before he was killed, um, they released several. Um, and, there were and, three. Yeah, invalidating yeah. some of my choices. I would have loved mm. to have watching the wheels, you know, but yeah, right, yeah, that was one. That was one that came to my mind too, and 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 woman was another one. I mean, but, but both of them were out as single, so you couldn't, you know. I would have put woman in there. I would have put mind games in there. I would have put instant karma in there. You know, well, I mean, but, those are we're, obvious. We're, those are obvious singles. You can't, you know. I know so. that. That's that's what I'm saying. If we included singles, yeah, right, would be in there. So. Yep, I think it was better to not to do the singles because they're so obvious. But this anyway. is much more fun, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Okay. I think in in your your list, the the outlier really was "I Know, I Know." Mm. And uh, is there anything else to say about that to convince people who are shrugging and saying, "Huh, I know, I know," and don't even know that one? Yeah. <laughs> I know that. See, that's the point. It's it's one of those kind of undiscovered undiscovered you know, masterpieces. Mm -hmm. It's really such a, it's such a beautiful song. Yeah. And the fact that, I mean, the, I, I agree. The others are pretty familiar and I, I, you know, I tried not to, uh, I didn't want to go too deep. I mean, cause those, those other four songs are just great songs and they, you know, but I mean, I know, I know it's just such an, uh, a wonderful song. And the thing is that a probably, probably a lot of people, you know, are going, yeah, what? You know, but yeah. it is it is really it is really a nice song. Yeah. So. Just out of curiosity, Steve, did you look on Facebook today? Because no. for John's birthday, I posted that song. No, ah. I did not. I yeah. did not notice you had posted that today. Yeah. No, I, 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 I basically, like I said, I basically used the Paul DeNoyer book for my to because he has all the songs listed. And I was looking for you know to get a just names of songs and and that's what attracted me and that you know and i was going through and you know and i just it, it just whatever hit me and i know i know you know hit me at one point and that's why i picked it and then i you know i played it and i went oh yeah definitely so okay so ken well i like what you said alan about you know stereotyping with john and paul because i've always said that you know, John Lennon wrote some some of the greatest love songs himself. It wasn't just the rocker, and Paul McCartney didn't just write love songs. He wrote a lot of great rockers, too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of ironic. The reason why I'm bringing that up is that of my five songs that I chose, four of them really are love songs or the softer side of John. The song that I picked at number five was Grow Old With Me. Mm -hmm. I just think that's a gorgeous song, a wonderful sentiment in there. The words flow perfectly, like great poetry. It's got a great melody to it. And in some ways, 
it's hard for me to pick which version I like more, the one that was just the demo, the one that was on Milk and Honey, or the one that had the George Martin and really Giles Martin, because Giles told me that he was working on that too, their orchestration on it. I like both treatments. In some ways, it's kind of haunting when it's just John and the piano. Mm -hmm. And then I like the whole orchestration as well. It's just a gorgeous song. I know John said that he wanted it to be a wedding song, and it was chosen by my wife and I. We had four wedding songs, and we had one from each of the Beatles, and that's the one we chose from John. Mm -hmm. It's just a gorgeous song. They're all with, along with me. The best is yet to be. And I um, just love everything about that song. Uh, the song that I picked at number four is one that has really grown over the years for me and one that I just appreciate so much more now than I ever did. And that's How mm -hmm. from the Imagine album. Very simple lyrics in there, but very powerful. You know, they're, they're words that we can all relate to at various points in our lives when we're confused, you know, about where we are uh, in our state of mind. You know, how can I go forward when I don't know which way I'm facing? Mm -hmm. To open a song with those words, I mean, how powerful is that? How many times have we all felt that yep. in life? You know, there's so many things expressed in that song. And it's a gorgeous melody. And uh, I love the orchestration around it. I love the, the, the way that John delivers it vocally. That feeling of kind of like uh, helplessness mm -hmm. in his voice. Um, I just think it's one of those undiscovered gems from, from John. Number three is the only one that I would consider to be a rocker. And that is I Don't Want to Face It. Okay. which I just happen to love from Milk and Honey. I love everything about it. The, the words are fantastic. You know, there's, there's um, uh, a sense of humor in John's lyrics. You want to save humanity, but it's people that you just can't stand. <laughs> uh, or it's something like you've got one eye on oblivion. What, what is it? You've got your eye on oblivion with one eye on the Hall of Fame. You know, the, the irony, the duality of that. Mm -hmm. um, I love that, and I love the bass line in the song as well, which is a uh, you know an important part of that song. Very catchy, you know. It's just one that whenever I think about the songs from Milk and Honey, it just jumps out at me. I love the six songs that John did on Milk and Honey, but for some reason that one just sticks with me more through the years. And yes, I love Nobody Told Me, but you know we're not doing singles here. Right. Uh, my number two song happened to be I Know I Know. Mm -hmm. because I just love the whole melody in there. I love his lyrics. I love the way the whole thing was arranged. It is a very beatle kind of song, in a way, melodically, mm -hmm. in terms of the harmonies. And there's a bass player who was on that album, Gordon Edwards, who did a fantastic bass line in that song. It's almost kind of what Paul might play, <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. in that song. And... Um, you know, every now and then in the solo careers of the Beatles, you'll find certain songs that you think might have worked with a Beatles arrangement. And um, that's one of them for me. I know, I know. I don't just love it for that reason. I love, uh, you know, everything about it. And uh, it's just one I think people should explore more. I've said many times that I think Mind Games is the most underrated of all of John Lennon's albums. And it's also my favorite of John's albums, also because... Probably because it doesn't get the exposure, you know, and um, it always sounds fresh to me. You know, I love every single song on that album. And uh, the number one song would have to be Out the Blue. I think Out the Blue is just a great love song. It's an outstanding love song that, you know, every fan of John should know mm -hmm. if you're going to pick songs that were not hits. And, um, you know, a great love song to Yoko and wonderful melody, great arrangement. You know, he was so skillful at doing that. And there are certain songs on the Mind Games album that, you know, I Assume a Sen is a favorite of mine. One Day at a Time is a favorite of mine. Of course, the title track. I love Intuition. You know, all of Side 2 is just phenomenal. Meat City is one of my favorite rockers of his. Mm -hmm. But as far as ballads go, Out the Blue is an outstanding one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of his best songs, you know, in his entire career. As I believe these songs are the ones that I picked, but those are the ones that, you know, it's, it's tough for me because I like every song that John did in his solo career, except one. <laughs> it used to be two, but now it's down to one. So are you going to tell I, us, you're going to tell us which one it is? 
Well, you know, when I was on a previous Beatles podcast, I mentioned one Beatles song that was not my favorite. And then I got a lot of heat for it because I'm never that critical. I'm hardly ever that critical. But if you if you really want to know, I'm not crazy about Angela. OK, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, it kind of meanders a bit as a song. It's not gripping in any way. I love the fact that John and Yoko wrote a song for Angela Davis. I'm not all that crazy about it. I used to not like I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, and now I like it a lot because mm-hmm. it's very free-form John. Right. You know, it's not a very structured song. It's kind of jazzy, and, you know, I wish that there was more of that mm-hmm. in John's solo career. But, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> all the songs there, on it. there's only one that I don't care for. He's had such a solid catalog overall. Those would be the five that I would pick. Okay. Uh, Steve, any reactions to Ken's choices? No. no I mean, I, I, he went uh, a couple of places that I didn't, but uh, no, I thought, I thought his were good choices. Uh, I, interesting that we both picked I Know, I Know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, my list was not a. I noticed Ken, you did a, a number five to number one list. I didn't. Mine weren't in any order. Uh, mine were just you know five yeah. songs. So yeah, okay, I just, that's fine. I just wanted to make that make that point. Anyway, but yeah. no, I, was a, I like I liked your list. So okay, there yeah. we go. Mine is um, like Steve's in that sense. I didn't do I didn't do it in any particular order either, um, except maybe more or less chronological, but then I sort of move them around in the playlist here, so it's, it's not even totally chronological anymore. Uh, I did not pick I Know, I Know. <laughs> so, uh-huh. And yet um, there were, I do have a couple of overlaps, uh, one with Ken, one with Steve. Um, and so going chronologically, the first one which overlaps with Steve is God. I love that song. Um, it's probably my favorite song from Plastic Ono Band. It is a great, except for, you know, My Mummy's Dead, it is a great ending to Plastic Ono Band. Uh, you know, because keep in mind, you know, we're getting this album as the first, if, you, if you're not counting Two Virgins and the famous Life with the Lions. It's, it's the first thing we're hearing from him, and also, I guess, not counting live peace in Toronto, after the Beatles broke up. Um, and so we want to know what he has to say, and, it's, you know, he's, mm-hmm. and he's just come out of the, you know, the Janoff thing, and, you know, there's a big Rolling Stone interview. and so this, who, just, who just passed away, by the way. That's Janoff, right. Janoff, yes, Janoff that's just right. passed away. I'm surprised. Yeah. You didn't pick yeah. anything from Life with the Lions, Alan? I'm, uh, I'm surprised. Well, um, I... Wait, of, wait, 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 wait. You've got another four to pick. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, <laughs> you don't know. It might be in there. That's yeah. true. You, okay. It, it could be, or I could put it in now, now that I see you're open to it. <laughs> um, uh, no, I'm going a more conventional uh, route this time. Um, okay. So the thing about God, you know, it, it's uh, there, there's there's a lot going on on that album, and then we want to hear, you know, what he has to say about the Beatles. And in God, he basically tells us that, among all the other things he doesn't believe. And it's also, you know, it's one of those songs that we've heard outtakes of, and he tried it so many different ways. I mean, there are, are acoustic guitar versions of it. There are... But I, he chose to release the one on the piano with, with, with the piano as the central instrument, and I, I think that that was a really good decision. I do kind of like the energy of some of the guitar ones. I mean, he sings it a lot more angry in, in some of the outtake versions. Um, and here it's more reflective, but... You know, even even the opening line, you know, God is a concept by which we measure our pain. I mean, that's a really interesting thing to think about, you know. I think it, it may offend some people with conventional notions of, you know, God and whatever, but um, I kind of think that, you know, he may have a point there, you know. Um, mm-hmm. a concept by which we measure our pain, you know, that's, there's, a, there's, there's really a lot to think about in that one line. Um, but mostly I think, you know, we, we think about the list at the end of people he doesn't believe in and ending with Beatles and then he believes in him and Yoko. And, uh, so, so in a way you get both sides of John in that one song, you get the angry John 
And you get the love song ballad, John, just in that last line at the end, you know. So that there's was... so much there's so much intensity in that song. Yeah, it's kind of like you know, the a day in the life of a uh, plastic Ono band. You know? That's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, I love the whole album. I could have chosen anything from that, but um, God to me is just really a, a standout. And uh, let's see. So on to imagine. Um, I chose "Give Me Some Truth" because. You know, again, that that to me, you know, How Do You Sleep was a contender, obviously, but I kind of, in a way, didn't want to get into the whole John versus Paul thing in this particular list. But, um, you know, that was that was a great song, too. But Give Me Some Truth. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, he's going through uh, Nixon trying to have him deported or, or J. Edgar Hoover trying to have him deported. Uh, but. Nixon is in there, too, and he gets into the lyrics um, almost every time the verse comes around, you know, son of Tricky Dick. So it, it's a, a song that, apart from the, the Tricky Dick reference, um, kind of dates it a little, but you take that one thing out, and that song is good for any old time. It's good for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's angry, and it's clever and it's well written and it's also a really great rocking track you know it's just it's played well it's uh it's got a great feel to it and um really kind of you know gets the adrenaline going and also george harrison gives a really stinging guitar solo mm -hmm. yep yep and the next one <laughs> along similar lines i mean it's I guess this is why I arranged the list to put these these three together. The next one is Steel and Glass. Mm. Um, another one of his angry songs. Um, and, you know, in this case, he's supposedly or pretty much overtly talking about Alan Klein, but he later went back and said, and, and it could apply to a lot of his songs, um, that he's also writing about him, you know, himself. He's, he he uh, did, I think, more self-analysis than a lot of people do. And um, he is often, you know, he'll often write a, a, a song that's very critical of someone else or some other situation. And then a couple of years later, he would give an interview where he'd say, you know, yeah, it's true. It was about that, but it's about me, too. And he said that about Steel and Glass. Mm. Um, but... I think maybe he also was trying to just sort of soft pedal the sting uh, on the Alan Klein thing too, because there's some really nasty stuff in that song, you know, mm -hmm. you, know you leave your smell like an alley cat. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know he didn't mince words. <laughs> mm. That was a thing about John. I mean, was one characteristic thing about John, it, it probably was that. And in all of the, my first three songs, that's that side of John, too. The next one is uh, my overlap with Ken. I chose Out of the Blue as well for pretty much the same reasons Ken said. It's a beautiful love song. It's the other side of John. And it's, you know, also it's a, it's a really attractive melody and it's a uh, nice production. And, you know, it just uh, it just sort of shows that that side of him in a very, I think, nicely developed way. Um, I mean, there are love songs and ballads all through his output. So there's always one to choose. But that one I, I just thought was exceptional. Mm -hmm. So I chose that. And then for the last one, uh, I actually was tussling between two of them but since one of you mentioned one of the two which was grow old with me um i'll go with the other which is i'm losing you <laughs> you can't agree with us you know well i do i do but you know i mean simply for the sake of giving the listeners more variety <laughs> um okay so I, I went with I'm Losing You, which I also really like, uh, maybe even like it better than, than Grow Old With Me anyway. But, um, you know, it just has a – it's a great track. In fact, both of the released versions, the one with Cheap Trick and the one that came out on Double Fantasy, 
are great versions. I think I prefer the Double Fantasy one, but I I, I really like them both. And it you know it, it was he's in autobiographical mode again, which he was a lot of the time, um, and probably in all five of my songs actually, where you know the story is he's in the Bahamas with with Sean and Yoko's selling cows, making deals, whatever, and he's basically writing a song saying, you know, we're not connecting, you know, in a way. And uh it's interesting and it's um it's 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 also just a, a good sounding track, even if you don't even bother with the lyrics. It's just a great track. Um the lyrics are great, mm-hmm. but so those were my five. Good list okay. overall from all three of us. Yeah, yeah, we should uh you like compilations so much, we should put all our songs together. Really? really? <laughs> None of us picked Working Class Hero, right? Right. Which yeah. is really a surprise. I, 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 in fact, Alan, I expected you to pick that. I don't know. I almost did. Uh, I, I, I kind of uh, mulled over that and decided not to, but uh, I'm surprised one of us didn't pick that. Uh, well, you know, but... here's the thing. You know, we decided on five. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, even though he didn't live long enough to make as many albums as, say, Paul or even Ringo, I knew that I couldn't pick really more than one song from an album, you know, if I wanted to try and, you know, represent his entire career, which is which I wanted to do. Um, So I thought, you know, I love working class here. I love everything on on Plastic Ono Band, really. But for me, God was the one, so that sort of meant I couldn't do Working Class Hero too. Right. Um, right. But in a way, if, if let's just say your five favorite songs all happen to be from the same album, yeah, you should be proud of that. You know, you should be proud to say that. You don't have to pick one from each album. Well, yeah, I wanted to spread though because I because you know I liked his entire solo career with the um, possible exception of some time in New York City. Um, and, uh, <laughs> which I didn't choose one from. So, uh, yeah, I wanted, you know, I, I, I like the whole spread of it. And so I wanted to get a, you know, the, the expanse of, of everything. So, yeah, I mean, if could have chose just one album and, um, but it, I, I, right. I felt it would have been limiting. <laughs> hmm. So we have a few honorable mentions from mm-hmm. each of us, don't we? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I already I already mentioned that all my love was hanging in the balance. There it was almost uh, I almost made my list, but I decided not to. But that was um, that was probably my uh, uh, my runner up. Uh, all my love, so hmm. which I adore. I adore that song. And I, it was it was very tough to keep that out. It was very tough to keep that yeah. out. So do I. I love that song. Yeah. Well, my runner-up was was Grow Old With Me, but, um, you know, you can look at, I mean, Remember on uh, Plastic Ono Band or even I Found Out, you know. I mean, very raw, very direct, very John, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in terms of, um, you know, stuff that they wouldn't play on the radio, um, I Found Out is just as rough as Working Class Hero in a way. Some of you uh, sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and well, well, well. I mean, you know, there are so many that that it, by by making it um, so that we couldn't choose singles, that actually did tie a hand behind our back because there were so many, you know, great ones that uh, would have loved to do, would have loved to include. Um, but they did release some of the some of the really best stuff. As singles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Even Woman is the Negro of the World is a song that I'd love now. Yeah. Whereas I didn't care for it when I was a teenager when it came yeah. out. Yeah. Now I love it to death. But I have a handful of honorable mentions. Okay. Which I could mention very quickly. Sure. Um, I love Scared a lot. Mm. Okay. I love the whole sound of it, the production of it, the lyrics, of course, John's vocals and how it builds in the song. Some great lyrics in that song. Very, very personal. I love that line, uh, you don't have to worry in heaven or hell. Just dance to the music. You do it so well. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. Mm. You know, it's uh, the sound of that record. It, it is haunting. 
Yeah. You know, and start off with the with the wolves howling. You know, yeah. I always play that song Halloween time on my show. Hmm. Meat City, I love a lot. It's a great rocker. I think you know, it's, yep. it's so catchy. Just got to get me some rock and roll. New York City, I do love. That's it's so Chuck Berry esque. That mm-hmm. song, I think. Clean Up Time is in there. Uh, I I love how funky that song is, mm-hmm. and the sound of the horns and how well it works in that song. I did put God in there as well. Just have to admire John so much for saying what he did in that song and being so brutally honest. Mm-hmm. And uh, Oh My Love is in there too. You know, it's just such a gentle ballad with a great melody. Has kind of an oriental feel to it. And uh, mm-hmm. just love that one. So those are just some of the honorable mentions from me. Okay. I was I was interested Ken when you were talking about saying you liked Sometime in New York City. I just remember when that album came out how how everyone really was down on it, you know. And it never it never really never really got all that much uh, atten- I shouldn't say attention. I mean, it, it was never really considered one of John's good albums. No, um, it's the one that everybody blasts. Right. You know, right. And a lot of people, because of the political nature of it and who he's writing about, look at it as being dated. But I can still appreciate songs about people from the past if I still like them as songs, if I like the melodies and the lyrics and the arrangements. I mean, John Sinclair is a song that I love a lot, and I love John's guitar work on the song. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very big part of that song. New York City, I mentioned. I happen to like um, Attica State a lot as a song. And I do like some of Yoko's songs on that album, too. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Sisters of Sisters, I think, you know, is one of my favorite songs of hers. And like I said, Woman is the Negro of the World is a song that I really appreciate now. And it's not just what John's expressing in that song. It's the whole arrangement of it. It is very Phil Spector-esque to me, although Phil was supposed to have worked on that song. Going by what Gary Van Syak told me, I think he only worked on that song. Maybe not much more than that. But it does have all those strings in the arrangements, which I think make the song somewhat haunting. Uh, The sax playing in the song is such a big part of that song. And I love the way that song ends, too. I like songs that at the end, it's like there's no resolve. Hmm. And with Woman is the Nigger of the World, when John kept singing, we make her paint her face and dance over and over again. You don't expect the song to end that way. Right. It's just so different. I love it for that reason. Much the same way, you know, Too Many People has a weird ending to it. Just that jam at the end. You don't expect it to go in that direction. Or for that matter, uh, maybe I'm Amazed is like that. But I like songs that have weird endings like that. Mm-hmm. So, and there's a lot of edge in the songs on Sometime in New York City. It was a good, for the most part, raw album, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think that was was sort of the point of it. He was saying it was sort of like journalism in a way, and it has the newspapery kind of cover, and the idea was to go in and, and react quickly, you know, like a troubadour to the news uh, and, and the political situation. And I... It, doesn't strike i mean yeah i guess now that you mentioned it's dated i guess in a certain way it is um i probably like it more now than i did when it came out but to me it just seemed like because it was done so quickly and on the fly and you know trying to get it you know into the shops while the issues were still hot it it seems really sort of half-baked to me i mean i don't like attica state much as a song i mean i i I understand, you know, the the issue, obviously. I um, mean, you know, I was, mm-hmm. you know, there at the time and, you know, and it was in the news and it was good that he said something about it. I just didn't think it was much of a song and like the live stuff on it. And um, and the other thing is that about the, the stuff they did with Zappa on it, um, Zappa released in a different mix. So you can get two right. mixes of that stuff. Um I think that probably, uh, yeah, what did he, he called, um, what is it, a small eternity with Yoko Ono? <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. um, I, I think they wouldn't have called their version that, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting having two mixes and, um, 
you know, and, and there is such a, as we talked about last week or the week before, such a small amount of live John stuff that um, it's great to have that second disc. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, yeah. I, I love the live version of Well. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's just good. It's great, edgy. You know, uh, rock and roll right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm not I'm not affected by songs where the subject matter uh, is a person from the past, or when there are political names mentioned from the past. You take a song like "Young Americans" from David Bowie, where he mentions President Nixon. That song sounds just as contemporary to me now as it did back then. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not really affected by that. Right. So it, it has more to do with the overall feel of the song, the melody. You know, the whole arrangement. And, of course, John's voice is a big part of it all, too, for me. So mm -hmm. John's one of my favorite singers, period. So he carries a song yeah. so well just because of the voice alone. Yeah. So it, it, It's just amazing to me that he didn't like his voice and was always trying to find ways of doing something with it on record, either double tracking or putting a lot of reverb or, or whatever. He, he had an incredible voice. Yep. Um, so... Some of the most talented people are the most insecure. So yeah, okay. So I think we've um, pretty much run out of time. And um, thank you both for coming up with your lists. I've, I had fun doing mine as well. And uh, I think uh, we'll just say how to get in touch with us uh, if you want to write to us as a group uh we you can contact us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com we have a twitter presence which is at things we said fab and we have a facebook page things we said today beatles radio fans so you can post on any of those people also post on the youtube versions of the show that we post you can hear us on youtube on podbean and you know, all kinds of um other places and uh we're on the tune in radio app mm -hmm. okay um and you can reach me at either alan cozen or alan cozen remixed on facebook and steve how can people reach you you can reach me at beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com, and I have my own personal Facebook page uh, that uh, I post music and other things, uh, and so you can catch me there. And then uh, um, a Beatles news and information page that uh, I post just Beatles stuff um, and a lot of it. So um, you're welcome to join me there, Ken. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Beatles trivia every single week. You can win prizes, one of nine great prizes every week. There's special contests as well. I should be starting a new one this week on the Brian Wilson compilation called Playback, and that's all solo music of Brian's. And again, that's at kenmichaelsradio.com. I also have a Facebook page, too, so you can friend me on there at Ken Michaels. Okay. All right. So, thank you both, and thank you all for listening. And for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.